Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation to the Board of Directors of the ACELC. Um, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I think this may be the first time that confessional Lutherans have met in the South. Now, I mentioned that to one of the guys as I was walking in. He said, well, we met in Texas last year or the year before. I said, that doesn't count. This is the South, folks. <laughs> and I know a little bit about that because my grandmother was born in Sevier County, which is where Gatlinburg Pigeon Forge is, if you all know where that is. If you go from Knoxville and head toward the Great Smoky National Park, it's a Hills and Hollers area. Well, all my relatives on my dad's side come from over there, and I can't talk like that, but I'm trying. <laughs> so if any of you from Tennessee, I got lots of roots. Uh, one of the pastors in my circuit has a cabin up there someplace, and he emailed me this week, I'm not kidding, and he said, you know there's a bunch of Nolans buried in the cemetery right near my cabin. I said, they're all over the place. I said, they've been there since the last war. He said, which war was that? I said, the one against King George III. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So the, so the Nolans and Delosiers and Heltons, they're all up there, uh, real hillbillies. Uh, originally, um, of course, a lot of those folks moved out, and uh, part of Great Smoky National Park was designed to preserve their uh, life and the evidence of it. And uh, so if you've never been to that park, you really ought to do it. It's part of our national heritage. It's not that far away. If you don't have time this time, I'd suggest you take a trip there. Okay, the uh, paper I'm presenting today, I'm not going to be able to read through all of it. I don't have time, but I, I, I think everything that's in there is important. So what I don't read, uh, please do on your own time. I gave this to the, um, uh, the Lutheran Concerns Association in January. I see a couple of you were there. Uh, I've added a few things since then. I haven't dropped too much out. So uh, those that were there may uh, note the new portions. So the title is uh, Short History of the Discipline and Dispute Resolution System of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Introduction. <clears throat> political philosophy, that is also known as political theory, has been occupied throughout its history with two perennial concerns. The first is the restraint within a state of the chief executive or monarch, so that his actions promote the common good instead of his private interests. That, by the way, is why we had the Revolutionary War. <clears throat> the second is the administration of justice, so that offenses are properly punished, the conflicts between members of society are settled, and that due process is followed. In the history of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, the first concern of political philosophy was dealt with at its very beginning in the case of Bishop Martin Stephan. He was accused of using the financial goods and certain women of the Saxons for his own private interests. This led the founders of the Missouri Synod to establish a constitution in which the chief executive of the church was restrained by the synodical convention, as well as by other checks and balances. This was paralleled at the congregational level so that the pastors of congregations were restrained by the voters' assemblies, as well as by other checks and balances. The second concern of political philosophy, that is the area of justice, has often been an afterthought in the Missouri Synod. Even today, at the congregational level, it is rare to find a constitution and bylaws that give much help to a president or elders attempting to adjudicate a case within a congregation. Just look at your own bylaws in your congregation. But we have always had a justice system of some sort at the synodical level. My essay intends to review the history of this system, how the Missouri Synod has dealt with offenses against its doctrine and moral standards, and how it settled conflicts when and where they occurred. Now the next section, the prehistory, is something that's new because I came across a new resource, which is the uh, Concordia Publishing House published the 1569 Church Order of... Um, Braunschweig-Wolfenbüttel, and this was 
authored by Martin Chemnitz and, um, uh, let's see, Jakob Andrei. And so you can look there and see what was the typical um, organization of the Lutheran Church in Germany from the 16th century up until, uh, well, in, up until the 20th century. This is what was typical for Germany. The Scandinavians had something else. But um, we should realize that when Walther and company brought over the Lutheran faith, they often brought over the Lutheran polity with them. And so uh, the roots of our ways of uh, administering the church really go back to either this church order or something like it. We don't have time to study that today, but I recommend it for you, and I'm also recommending that our synodical president and his floor committees look at it too. And he has great interest in it because the opening essay is an essay that President Matthew Harrison wrote explaining the significance of that church order. Well, my essay is about the Missouri Synod, so let's go to the next section. Page 2, LCMS, first period, conventions and ad hoc committees. The, the heading there explains how we dealt with these issues. In the Synod's first con constitution of 1847, the Synod president was given the responsibility of visiting in a three-year period every congregation and pastor in order to review their doctrine, life, and performance of duties. He was to strictly follow detailed visitation instructions, they're called instructions, they were adopted by the Synod and published with the Constitution. As part of his visit, the President was to effect a peaceable settlement if there were differences between the pastor and the congregation. If there were other disputes between groups or individuals within a congregation, the President could also settle those cases, but only if all persons involved in the dispute requested arbitration. At the Synodical Convention, which was at first held annually, the Synod President was to report on his visitation from the previous year. If there was a case of a pastor who had continued in wrong doctrine or an offensive life, and the pastor had been reprimanded several times by the Synod President, the congregation involved, and the ministerium, that would be the pastors around his area, then the Synod President was supposed to report this to the Synodical Convention. On the basis of this report, the Convention was to reprimand the offending pastor, and if this reprimand failed, the pastor was then to be expelled. In 1854, a new constitution was adopted by the Missouri Synod. The primary change was the creation of districts, initially four in number. The Synod President's duties of visiting congregations and pastors, the reporting of erring pastors, and the settlement of disputes were all handed over to the district presidents. Those duties have been with the district presidents ever since 1854. In those days and until the latter 20th century, district presidents were full-time pastors, not full-time executives as they are today. In the 1854 Constitution, cases of erring pastors were to be reported by the district presidents to their district conventions in the same manner in which the Senate president had handled those cases under the previous Constitution. The district conventions were to reprimand the erring and obstinate pastors and expel them if there was no change in response to the reprimand. Urgent cases of dispute within congregations were to be settled by the district president or by an ad hoc committee appointed by him. If the matter was not urgent, the case was to be settled by the district convention. The Senate president now had a different job. In the 1854 Constitution, he had the supervision over the doctrine, practice, and the respective administration of all church workers, all Senate and district officers, the districts, the pastoral conferences, and the congregations of Senate. But his supervision was severely limited to, quote, giving advice, admonition, and reproof. Unless the affairs of the Synod required his participation in a case, and he was expressly invested with such power. So this meant that when someone or some group went awry, the Synod president could only report 
the problem to the district president or district convention. Finally, the case could be brought to the Senate convention if necessary, but that convention always understood itself to be a final court of appeal. How did this work out in practice? Vice President Daniel Preuss published an illuminating article in the Epiphany 2003 issue of Logia titled Church Discipline in Early Missouri and Lutheran Identity. It is now available as a free download on the Logia website and I recommend that you read it. In summary, Preuss states, quote, already by the 1870s, in view of the limited time available at the synodical and district conventions, invest investigations were handled mostly by committees. The final ruling, however, continued to be made by the synodical convention. As to the process of discipline or arbitration, you know, those are two different things. Arbitration is you have two parties and they're fighting it out and you're trying to get them together again. Discipline has to do usually with the pastor or church worker who is either teaching incorrectly or has a moral failing. As to these processes, I assume that when C.F.W. Walther's Pastoral Theology was published in German in 1872, that its chapters on fraternal discipline, public repentance, and excommunication were used as a guide. And he there quotes from all sorts of stuff in Germany uh, for centuries prior. For difficult cases, Walther referred the reader to the 1664 Wittenberg Councils and the 1623-1671 Treasury of Councils and Decisions edited by Georg Dedekinus. These books in Latin were collections of judicial decisions made by the Orthodox Lutheran faculties for church discipline and dispute cases in the 16th and 17th century. In 1902, August Grebner published an essay in English about the use of evidence in church discipline. That became part of John Fritz's pastoral theology in 1932. Fritz's work was still being used at LCMS seminaries and by LCMS pastors through the late 1980s, and some of the pastors here may have that on their shelf. I'm going to be skipping through the actual cases uh, since the main thing we need to look at today is the process and the structure. So let's skip through to the end paragraph in that section. So that would be in the bottom of page, no, top of page four, second paragraph. I give a couple of cases there. Again, you can read that later. In summary, the first period saw the administration of cases by district presidents with the decision to expel or final decision in disputes being made by the district convention or synod convention. This entailed the use of ad hoc committees at the discretion of the district or synod presidents or by decision of the conventions. The LCMS second period, 1941 to 1971, this is when the board of appeals or boards of appeals were the structures that were used. The 1941 convention created permanent board of, boards of appeals for both the districts and synod. The intent was to avoid the pitfalls of the ad hoc committee system and to keep most adjudicatory matters out of the synod and district conventions, which I think was a smart idea. And we have enough conflict in our conventions as it is. And cases are always conflictual by their very nature. The 1941's preceding state, Synod and each district shall elect a board of appeals, that of Synod consisting of four clergymen and three laymen, and that of district of not fewer than three clergymen and two laymen. Their term of office shall be six years. No member shall serve on this board successively longer than two years. No administrative or executive official of Synod or of any of its districts shall be a member of a Board of Appeals." End of quote. The prohibition of synod and district officials from serving on Boards of Appeals was in keeping with the American principle of the separation of executive and judicial powers. I think it was a good idea. It also spared synod and district officers from the type of backlash that President Fotenhauer had to endure 
due to his necessary and legitimate involvement in the Brooks case, which I detail in the, uh, the previous section. The synodical president's powers in cases of adjudication or discipline changed significantly in 1941. Now we're talking about the synod president. Before 1941, if the synod had an erring district president, the synodical president was to deal with him, and if that proved fruitless, then he was to report it to the National Convention. And that process is still in place. You can see LCMS Constitution Article 11b2. Before 1941, the Synodical Convention would then take up the case and to decide what to do with that district president. In the revisions of 1941, nobody seemed to have noticed that the linkage between the two parts of the disciplinary process had been severed. Today, the Synod President may still deal with an erring district president and report him to the Synod Convention. But the Convention no longer has a process for dealing with the erring district president. It is like having policemen who can arrest but having no ju judge to bring the criminals to trial. The essential part of the justice system is missing and therefore our district presidents are unaccountable since 1941. Think about that. Gene White, that wasn't in uh, the LCA. It's something I found out since then. Keep working on it. So it's, just think about it. Why has the Missouri Synod been kind of, since 1941, been going slowly but surely downhill? It's been in the district presidents, and they're not accountable to anybody except their own personal buddies within the district. There you go. You got stuff to work on there, folks. Okay, let's keep moving. The 1941 and 1971 bylaws, Senate conventions could still review a case considered by the District or Senate Board of Appeals by forming a committee of review. This committee, elected at the convention, was charged only with de determining whether errors were made in procedure, and if so, the case was remanded back to the Synod Board of Appeals for correction. That's kind of like how it works at the, uh, the civil court, where civil courts will uh, review cases for procedural errors. In 1965, the Synod Convention gave to the district presidents the power to suspend a church worker from his duties and responsibilities of office before a Board of Appeals had determined that he was guilty. Does that make any sense? Now this was a definite move toward an Episcopal system. Episcopal means that the district president serves like a bishop and he can cut you off at the knees or wherever he wants at any time. That's what, a, that's what a bishop does. And that did not sit well with the synod because we've never been Episcopal in that respect. The matter of restriction and suspension by district presidents was revised several times, 69, 71, 83 and 86. And then uh, we go to the section that has uh, the case about Pastor Otten. It is there uh, for your reading. Now we're at the top of page 5, third paragraph. Into the LCMS third period, commissions on adjudication and appeals. <clears throat> In 1971, the Synod Convention revised the Board of Appeals system. Instead of two, it created three types of judicatories, district commissions on adjudication, the synodical commission on adjudication, and three, the synodical commission on appeals. The synodical commission on adjudication was the venue for cases in which the synod, a district, or one of their agencies or employees was a party to a case. All members of these three commissions were to be elected by their respective convention, that is either district or synod. The adjudication boards consisted of four clergy and three laymen, at least two of which laymen were to be lawyers. The commission on appeals consisted of five clergy and four laymen, at least two of which were to be lawyers. The 1941 prohibition of synodical and district officers and staff serving on these commissions was continued 
with the exception of members of synodical seminaries and colleges. With the possibility of the review of cases by the Synod Convention uh, via its Committee of Review, that possibility was eliminated in 1971. In other respects, the Commissions on Adjudication and Appeals operated in a similar manner as the previous Boards of Appeals. The difference between the two can be found by comparing the second period general rules governing Boards of Appeals with the third period rules of procedure. And then I get into the case of Robert Preuss. Actually, I think um, Rolf is going to be talking, is it Rolf going to be talking about that? So uh, you'll get some detail, but I've also laid out the essentials in this, uh, in this paper. Okay, please skip now to, uh, let's see, it would be the top of page six. LCMS fourth period, 1992 to 2004, the dispute resolution system. Now, when you all decided of the 10 errors that were wrong with the Missouri Senate, you really weren't saying that you were opposed to discipline in the church. Of all people, you're the ones that are most interested in discipline in the church. I know that. What you are opposed to is this system that was inaugurated in 1992. So let's see what it was. A committee called the Task Force on Conflict Resolution was appointed by President Bowman in January 1990 to review the entire system of adjudication and appeals. It should be observed that the Preuss case was uppermost in the Synod's president mind at that time. The task force proposed a complete overhaul of the Synod's adjudicatory offices and procedures under the general principle of conflict resolution, which was then adopted at the 1992 convention. The preamble gave the rationale for these radical changes. I quote, the process presented by the task force offers the Synod a new procedure for conflict resolution that is A, thoroughly biblical, B, stresses the reconciliation of members within the family of God, encouraging a win-win rather than win-lose resolution of conflict, C, presents a positive witness to the secular community as to how Christians resolve their conflicts, D provides for final resolutions of disputes in a timely manner. E is less costly in terms of money and time. F discourages the secular approach of adversarial litigation. And G requires a face-to-face -face meeting of the complainant and respondent in a spirit of Christian reconciliation." End of quote. Now, whether any of these statements are true, they were the selling points that convinced delegates to adopt the new system. In the new dispute resolution system, the previous prohibition of synodical and district officers and staff from serving as officers in the system was removed, as was the limitation of holding multiple offices. Reconcilers, who are really judges in many cases, were appointed in groups of four, with no more than two pastors in each group. The requirement to have lawyers serving as adjudicatory officers that was found in the previous period, 71 to 92, was eliminated. And I remember at the convention, people making arguments from the stage against lawyers in general. And that, the reason was to try to get that through. Dispute resolution panels at the synodical level were to include at least one pastor and one layman in a group of three. The selection of the reconcilers was to be done by the district board of directors based on a list supplied by circuit counselors. The synodical dispute resolution panels were chosen from the total roster of reconcilers by casting lots. Now I know this is throwing a lot at you because it's a very complex system and I can't go into all those details. I'm just kind of sketching it. There are many things that could be said about the problems inherent in this new system, and I think some of my co-presenters will be doing that today. I have only a few comments to make. First, in this system, there is confusion between dispute cases and expulsion cases in the bylaws, and that's in the period from 1992 to 2004. 
Second, the term reconciler is deceptive. Although reconciliation is appropriate where no harm has been done, restitution is also a Christian principle that needs to be observed where loss is suffered. Third, dispute resolution is a needed function and was part of the original LCMS visitation by the Synod President and later by District Presidents. So we've been doing it theoretically all along. I can only guess that it was made part of the adjudication system because District Presidents were no longer doing their job. Fourth, CTCR and CCM rulings, which are absolutely binding on cases in the dispute resolution system, are rendered ex parte. That's a Latin a legal term. That means without notice or hearing. So a case is being decided in which you have a lot to lose and you don't know what's going on. And you don't have a right to be there in your own defense or to have anybody else there. That's ex parte. It's absolutely contrary to due process. This prevents, this principle of ex parte prevents these commissioners, it's on their side now, from understanding the full implications of what they're ruling on. And more importantly, denies to the defendants and complainants a fundamental right of due process. The ACELC recently discovered this when a ruling was made against them by the CCM without their being notified. Finally, lawyers and any sort of advisor are prohibited from attending hearings so that both complainants and defendants are left to their own devices in church court. Those who are not knowledgeable in the law, whether civil or church law, could easily be taken advantage of by unscrupulous church officers or persons opposing them. Now, I give another case here. This is the David Benke case. Now, let's skip down to the current period, LCMS fifth period, the top of page seven. Dispute resolution system and hearing panels. In my opinion, the dispute resolution system did not handle the Benke case well, and not just because of its outcome. I think that the Senate president and his blue ribbon task force also came to the same conclusion because they proposed another major revision to the adjudication system as soon as possible, that is to the 2004 convention. Although it had a number of faults, the system introduced in 2004 was an improvement because it separated cases that were disputes and that needed reconciliation from cases that were potential expulsions. The 2004 revisions to the bylaws also provided for a modified system for judging expulsion cases involving Senate and district officers and staff, for cases in which the Senate president is a defendant, and for cases of sexual misconduct or criminal behavior. I've analyzed the 2004 system as it presently exists in the 2013 Handbook of Synod in a flowchart that is available at the website of Brothers of John the Steadfast, and the web address is in your footnotes. So if you want to figure out, well, if I end up in this thing, where am I going to go? That flowchart might be able to be helpful to you. It is not unusual for LCMS people to hear about an erring pastor, teacher, professor, or congregation, and then wonder why the Senate president doesn't do anything about this. If the error happens at the parish level involving a pastor, teacher, or commissioned church worker, or the congregation is to blame, according to the Constitution, the Senate president can do nothing about it other than to tell the district president to go do something about it. See, the Senate president doesn't have jurisdiction at the local level. The district president can and has at times ignored the Senate president with impunity. This is the government that the Missouri Senate established in the 1854 revisions to our Constitution, and it has remained so ever since. A recent ruling of the Commission on Constitutional Matters confirms this. An important CCM ruling, check your footnotes on that one. The Senate president was also removed 
from supervision over the LCMS universities and colleges in 1995 when they were reincorporated as the Concordia University system. So they're also outside of his jurisdiction. Their faculty and presidents report to the CUS board and its president. The Senate president now only has disciplinary authority over Senate officers, that would be like the treasurer, the vice president's secretary, employees of the Senate, actually under the umbrella of the Senate incorporation, districts as a corporation, and district presidents. That's it. But even with regard to these persons, the decision to dispel or expel, uh, to di discipline or expel, is made by panels of district presidents and a reconciler. See the bylaws that I show you there. So the Senate president is only a first responder. He does not make final decisions in any of these cases. And if he knows who's on those panels that will be making those decisions, why is he going to start a case when he knows they're going to going to declare them innocent. So all he is is a first responder. He does not have, since 2004, he doesn't have decision in the final case. In order to resolve the problem of the Senate President's weak to non-existent authority over erring district presidents, my congregation and others have memorialized the Synod with the overture, quote, to support proper ecclesiastical supervision in synodical districts. You can go to the footnote website and see what it, what it says. This provides a process by which district presidents may be held accountable for their failure to exert doctrinal discipline and may be removed from office if and when the synodical president and the synodical convention both agree that this needs to be done. And that goes back to the way the Synod used to do it back before 1941. This will also prevent some districts from falling into the bad habit of doctrinal indifference. Finally, a word needs to be said about how the synodical and congregational adjudication systems work out in the civil courts. This is an addition now to my paper, but I think you need to know about some of these cases. Three recent cases that pertain directly to the LCMS and how its congregations and church officers and pastors relate to the civil courts. What if a case ends up in the civil court? How will the civil court rule? The first is the 1985 appeals case, Whirling versus Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church of River Forest. Yes, that's the Grace Lutheran Church that you all know about. And finally, 85 is when it was finally all, that was the last appeal. In this case, the civil courts admitted they cannot determine whether the LCMS is congregational or hierarchical. The best lawyers in Chicago don't know what we're doing. Uh, maybe we don't either. Therefore, the civil court cannot defer to the decisions of the Senate, its districts, or its church courts when Senate attempts to rule over a congregation. So basically they've said, we can't figure it out, so you're congregational. The second case is the 2012 Supreme Court, Supreme Court case, Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church versus EEOC. See, you probably heard about that a couple years ago. In that case, which was considered a victory for religious freedom, the court decided that a congregation's right to choose its minister cannot be infringed upon by federal or state laws. Hey, that sounds good to me. Although a victory for the rights of congregations, it means the ministers of religion have little or no protection under federal or state laws when it comes to their employment, compensation, benefits, or similar matters. You get into the job, you should know that. You can't appeal to the state when it comes to all these laws that protect other workers. The third case is the 2015 case, Hillenbrand versus Christ Lutheran Church, Birch Run, Michigan. In this case, a pastor of a church who had served for seven years was terminated by his congregation. He appealed to the LCMS dispute resolution process. And the LCMS dispute resolution process ordered that the pastor 
should be reinstated until he received and accepted a call to another congregation. And that the congregation who terminated him should give him back pay and compensation for benefit costs and trial costs. The congregation responded by terminating its membership in the synod, and they did not reinstate their former pastor. The civil court which heard the case determined that the LCMS is congregational, that should, says congregation, it should be congregational in its polity. That, that affirms what the, the Grace River Forest case said. This means that the synod is advisory with respect to congregations, even in adjudication cases. The court also determined that the only remedy available to the synod in such cases is to revoke the membership of a congregation. Dispute resolution panels or any church court cannot tell congregations in the LCMS whom or what they have to pay in damages or other forms of compensation. Furthermore, since the congregation had left the synod, the synod had no authority to bind the congregation under civil law. Now, I cannot advise you what these three civil court means, uh, court cases mean with respect to specific cases you or others might be involved in. I'm not trained in the law and I cannot advise in that area. I only bring these three cases to your attention because attorneys who are dealing with cases pertaining to the LCMS and its members need to pay attention to these three cases and to consider their, mer their merits as precedent in, in court. Conclusion. The LCMS now has a better system for settling disputes and for dealing with offenses than it did in its fourth period from 90, 90, 1992 to 2004. But this is little consolation to those pastors and other church workers who were expelled from the synod, who were removed from their calls and livelihood, or who voluntarily left the synod because they were poorly treated in that period. The present system has its own faults, as the recent case of Professor Matthew Becker demonstrated. The Lutheran Concerns Association has offered an overture to the 2016 convention to appoint a new task force so that we may do better as a synod in treating our church workers and preserving the gospel among us. I encourage you to support that overture to Synod through your delegates to our convention in Milwaukee in July 2016. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>